The Lord be with you. Welcome to this worship service. Right before the pandemic, we got a new hymnal here at uh, Princeton Seminary. Santo, 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 holy, holy, holy. And we didn't get to share it with uh, hardly anybody for the two years that uh, we were in pandemic times. And so we're so grateful to be able to do that, uh, to share it with you today. Everything is in two languages, some in three languages, some more. But I would, one of the beautiful things about bilingual worship is hearing two languages sometimes at the same time. But if you've been in a bilingual congregation, you know that almost always there's one language that seems to be dominant. And it really is sometimes difficult when you are in that non-dominant language uh, to kind of push through uh, with your language, with your, with your heart language. Uh, so sometimes we just, when we worship today, we always have the options of English or Spanish. Uh, sometimes we're gonna ask us all to sing a verse in Spanish, but sometimes we can just listen out for each other. And I invite you to look at our last hymn, which is number 305. When peace like a river, de paz inunda mi senda. And if you look at the refrain, it's so beautiful because there's an echo. We, it, the way I grew up singing it in English, it is well, it is well, with my soul, with my soul. But here, we can listen for another, we can sing our own language and listen for another language with that call and response. So I invite you, if you want to do the first part to sing in English, if you do the second part to sing in Spanish, so it'll be, it is well, estoy bien, with my soul, gloria a Dios. So, and then when we get to the last phrase, again, we can mix the languages up. Should we try that? Um, English first, here we go. It is well, respond in Spanish, estoy bien, with my soul, gloria Let's try that again. So if you choose the first part, sing in English. Here, English. It is well. Spanish. Estoy bien with my soul. Glory. Last time, we're going to do that one more time. We'll take it to the end. Here we go. It is well. It is well. That's the ending. The beginning is actually in your bulletin, and it's a Taizé chant. With you, O oh Lord, is life in all its fullness. The choir will get us started, and during the singing of this song, we'll light our candles, and uh, we'll learn a little bit later on when we'll bring those candles forward. But this is our lamp lighting song, our candle lighting song, With You, O oh Lord.
Beloved, in our worship service today, we remember graduates of Princeton Theological Seminary who have passed away since we've gathered since the last reunion. As Chip Hartwick will read the names for us, we understand that these names that are read represent lives, lives of parents and partners and siblings and grandparents. These names represent lives of pastors and professors, teachers and chaplains, missionaries, musicians, and much more. These names represent lives of classmates and colleagues and confidants and cherished friends. These names represent lives that have brought light into this world, a light that has, sh that has sh shined all around this globe. In our service today, we invite you to help us remember the light of these individuals. In a moment, as Chip reads the names, we invite you to come front through the center aisle and place your candle in one of the um, containers of sand. If you could start in the back, that would be great, and work forward. Um, and then we invite you to return to your seat by the side aisles. If you prefer not to come forward, just hand your candle to someone else, a neighbor, as they, as they do. So, beloved, thank you for helping us to remember and to celebrate the lives of these graduates. Class of 1946, Paul H. Wilson. Class of 1947, Anne Marie Melrose. Class of 1948, James A. Cogswell, Edwin A. Schick. Class of 1949, Bruce H. Williams. Class of 1950, Lutard N. Ide. Class of 1951, David R. Aronson, George F. Gillette, and John Emerson Shettle. Class of 1952, Robert E. Stover, Richard L. Van Dusen. Class of 1953, John C.S. Kim, William C. Lair, Betty Gilmer Young. Class of 1954, Fred W. Cassell, George H. Keem, Alice McFeely Malloy, William J. Peck, Donald F. Sears. Class of 1955, Alfred T. Davies, Frank S. Hamilton, Anne Leanne Meiskins, Robert W. Schaffer, Francis A. Youngkin. The class of 1956, George C. Fuller, Henry G. Morgan, Joe David Ruffin, and Silvio J. Scorza. Class of 1957, Donald D. McCall, Caton R. Palmer, John W. Sloat, Richard F. Stone. Class of 1958, Robert R. Ball, Margaret E. Howland, and William J. Weber. Class of 1959, Robert W. Kahn, Barry Gray, Edward O. Nyhus. Class of 1960, J. Raymond Brubaker, Charles L. Curitan III, Ronald G. Fraze, Donald S. Hawk, P. William Hutchinson, Donald T. Jackson, Barbara A. Roche, Alan A. Rushido, and Douglas M. Smith. Class of 1961, Howard H. Cox, Karen Winruth Lanchester, 
Thomas A. Phillips, Robert F. Tuttle, Gilberto Vargas Gutierrez, Class of 1962, William E. Foreman, Theodore E. Haas, Tick Not Han, C. James Hench, Frederick R. Compass, Jr., Thomas Edgar McAdam, Roger W. Nostbakken, and Tetsua Peter Yoshida. Class of 1963, Joseph W. Cookson, Augustus Scott Feather III, Joel Gajardo, Abdel Masi Istafanas, Benton M. Newcomer, Robert C. Pryor, Frank H. Thompson. Class of 1964, Carl C. Cassell, Peter Fast, Stillman Allen Foster Jr., Ching Fen Xiao, J. Roger Hull Jr., Edward A. Johnston. The class of 1965, M. V. Abraham, Walter D. Clark, Ronald L. Krieger, Dave A. Ramsey, J. Cy Rowell, and Jack G. Schutte. The class of 1966, Benjamin Chow. The class of 1967, Eugene Lawton and Tiat Han Tan. Class of 1968, James E. Clark, Richard J. Lichty, H. Donald Mares, Alan Charles Menarsik, William B. Neal, John M. Noah, and Joseph Oscar Rand, Jr. The class of 1969, Thomas S. Baker and Graham Shaw. Class of 1970, R. Wayne Frey and Neil Shozo Fujita. Class of 1971, Donald G. Lewis, Jr. and David T. Abelos. Class of 1972, William J. Ogman, Jr., David B. Calhoun, and Harvey E. Vanskyver. The class of 1973, Randall Lee Saxon, Rodney C. Shoemaker, and Yuri H. Smith. The class of 1974, John K. Allen, Paul Lowell Bramer, Stephen E. G. Malamed Sr., Rogelio T. Pangelinan, Robert P. Sanders Jr., the class of 1975, Vivian Jean King Hill and Antonia Gelser Malamed. Class of 1976, Joseph F. Alucius Jr. Class of 1977, Stephen R. Garstead, Robert F. Hull Jr. and Henry Z. McCrary. In the class of 1979, Robert A. Wendell. Class of 1982, Jean R. Pletcher. Class of 1983, John F. Netterman. Class of 1984, Judith Duke Dean. Jeffrey William Smith. Nancy N. Thornton. And Beverly K. Weatherly. Class of 1985, W. Greg Monroe. Class of 1987, Letitia M. Johnston and Joseph M. Wagner. Class of 1991, William Lee Kenny. Class of 1992, Mark V. Mason and John A. Shuck. Class of 1995, Jennifer L. Wegter McNelly. Class of 1997, Eric Van Leninger. 
class of 1998, Patricia Thomas Moore, class of 1999, Sylvia L. Massey, and Donald Bruce Pike. The class of 2005, Nancy J. Nelson, and Emeriti faculty, James N. Lapsley, Jr., and J. Vinsel Van Hoisting. Beloved, let us pray. O tender, loving, and eternal God, we offer our prayers of heartfelt gratitude for the lives that we have named and for the light of these faithful graduates. As we look at these lights that shine before us, we also remember other losses that we've experienced in our own lives this past year. We remember loved ones and colleagues and church members and friends who have joined this great cloud of witnesses that we remember and celebrate today. We know, O oh Holy One, that these candles can be blown out at the end of a service but we also know deep in our souls that we light these candles in the name of the one whose light will never go out of our lives. We light these candles in the name of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and it's his name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. 
Holy and merciful God, we come before you together as former and current students, not only of Princeton Theological Seminary, but students of your instruction that gives us a sense of being, movement, and direction in a confusing world. We confess, Lord, that we do not always recognize, comprehend, and respond justly to the struggles, tragedies, and laments of the world, of our neighbors, and of ourselves. We ask humbly for you to forgive us our sins. And we thank you for your abundant gift of grace and steadfast love. And though now we see through a glass darkly, in this space, O oh Lord, make us more beautiful in your image. Amen. I would just like to say that we're very glad that you're here for worship today. And I'd especially like to thank our worship leaders for today. We've heard from Chip and Jeremiah. Um, April and DJ are gonna be reading scripture. Um, we're delighted our choir is back. And we welcome Michael Gittens, who's part of our chapel team. He's here today. Um, I'd like to just say, though, a special word of introduction and thanks to our preacher for today. And that is the Reverend Dr. Victor Aloyo Jr., who is currently the Associate Dean for Institutional Diversity and Community Engagement at PTS. But in not too near distant future, as many of you may have already heard, uh, it, was, it was announced yesterday that Reverend Dr. Victor Aloyo Jr. will be the new president of Columbia Theological Seminary. I love it how the Holy Spirit arranges these things sometimes that Victor would end up preaching today, because I know this was arranged a long time ago. Um, I would just say before we continue with our service, Victor, after 33 faithful years in this community, and because of that, you know so many of these people here, um, it will be very hard for, to see you go this summer. Um, however, we are just so delighted um, for you and Suzette and your family for this wonderful new opportunity and we celebrate you with all our heart. Our first reading comes to us from 1 Kings chapter 17. Listen for the word of God. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there. For I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there, gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar, and only a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The jar of meal will not be emptied, and the jug of oil will not fail, until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she was, as well as her and her household, they ate for many days. 
the jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. But he said to her, Give me your son. He took her from her bosom, carried him up to the upper chamber where he was lodging, and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, let the child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again, and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house, and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Our gospel lesson comes from Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 11. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man got up and began to speak. And Jesus said, gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us. And God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God around us, and the word of God within us, we say, thanks be to God. Six in the hymnal, the purple hymnal, bilingual hymnal, Vencera el Amor, Love Shall Overcome. We'll sing it all the way through first in Spanish, and then we invite you to join us the second time through in the language of your choice.
Friends, I stand in awe this afternoon before you. Thank you. Thank you for your affirmations. As Suzette and I will continue to move forward and serve in ministry at Columbia Theological Seminary, I am stand in awe and I'm grateful for the amount of years that Princeton Seminary has granted me to grow, experience grace and discernment, and for many that I know here today, I stand in awe. Friends, greetings to our alumni reunion attendees. I take this opportunity to appreciate Dr. Craig Barnes, the Reverend Ann Henley Nicholson, the Reverend Jan Ammon, and the alumni reunion planning team for the opportunity of proclaiming the word on this service of remembrance. Join me in prayer. We pray that you will open the mouth of your servant to proclaim the word in the power of the Spirit. And we pray that this same Spirit will open the hearts of its hearers here assembled to receive your holy gospel. In Christ's name we pray, amen. A widow stands at the gate of Zarephath. She is looking for a couple of sticks. Drought has dried up the land, so they should not be too hard to find. The drought has affected everything. Wells are dry and crops have failed. Her life is as dry and parched as the land. No food, no water, no future. She will build a two or three stick fire. It does not need to be large. She, she has only a handful of meal and a little oil. She will bake some bread. It will be the last meal. She and her son will eat. She tells Elijah and die. Another widow walks with a crowd of people to the gate of Nain. It is a funeral procession for her son, her only son. With no husband and now no son, she has no identity, no sense of place or belonging. Her security is gone. She is alone and on her own. And whether it is first century Palestine or today, that is a risky place to be. These stories are not just about widows. They are about life and the God who meets us in the struggles and challenges of life. These stories are as real today as the day they happened. People live these stories every day. Last week, I was at a meeting in which a woman parishioner spoke about the death of her child. She said she often fantasized about and asked God that her son might be given back to her on the fifth anniversary of his death. She only wants what the widow of Nain got. Who can blame her? She wants the life she used to have. She wants the sense of meaning, of belonging, and relationship that used to be. She, she wants to be told, do not weep. And to hear the words, young man, I say to you, rise. She wants her son and her life to be given back to her. She only wants what the widow of Zarephath got. Who can blame her? She wants the emptiness and hunger and famine of her life to go away. She longs for the jar of meal that will, that will not be emptied and the jug oil that will not fail. She wants the abundance and fullness of life. Like the widows of Nain and Zarephath, she stands at the city gate, the place of change and transition, the place where people and life come and go, she is really no different from us. The circumstances may be different, but like her, we too have stood at the city gate watching life change and seemingly slip away. 
I recall stories of young children during these past couple of years needing to see their parent or grandparent, uncle or loved one because they were unable to visit, touch, or care for them in their last moments in the hospital. Sometimes it is death of a loved one or the end of a marriage. Other times it is the loss of a dream or health, financial security, or the end of a career. Whenever we seem to have lost our way, our faith, meaning, identity, or enthusiasm for life, we stand at the city gate. More often than not, it seems, we stand at the city gate wishing that things could be different, fantasizing what it would be like if only. If only we could take back words that were spoken in anger or fear. If only we would have spoken the words of love, beauty, and thankfulness that went unspoken. If only, if only we had made different choices for our lives. If only we could redo our marriages and relationships. If only we could go back and reorder our priorities. If only we could have given back to us the people and parts of our lives that have died. It is not just as individuals that we wish we could go back to the way it used to be. Many in our churches and denominational lives speak with great longing about what it used to be like. Even here and in many theological institutions across the country, there is the hope that our school would become what it used to be 10, 15 or 20 years ago, bustling at the scenes of students having conversations on the quad, meeting called servants from across the globe with no worries of an endemic time. Certainly the people in Buffalo, New York, and Laguna Woods, California, and many communities where mass shootings and gang-related violence wish life could just go back to the way it was before enduring the tragic pain of loss and trauma. No doubt the widows in our readings wanted to go back to the way it was before, before death, before famine, before life brought them to the city gate. We must not, however, take today's Old Testament and gospel stories literally. Otherwise, we, we will surely stand at the city gate waiting for Elijah or Jesus to come along and turn back time. We will be waiting for the magic and fantasy of a fifth year anniversary, whatever that may look like in our lives. We must, however, take these stories seriously. A literal reading of the stories makes them nothing more than the newscasts of past events. It leaves us wondering, why them and not me? To take them seriously, though, keeps them alive and relevant to us today. It makes them our stories. To take these stories literally places the focus on the widows and what they got. However, to take these stories seriously places the focus on Elijah, Jesus, and what God is doing in our lives and world. That is what the two widows do. In neither story do the widows point to themselves or speak about what they got, sons, meal, oil. They direct their and our attention to God's presence, God's faithfulness, God's words. They bear witness to and glorify the God who meets us at our city gates. The city gate is a place of change and loss, but that it is not the ultimate meaning. It is rather the place where God's prophets meet God's people. It is the place where the funeral processions of our lives are interrupted and stopped by Jesus' procession of life. Let the church say amen. amen. It is the place of divine compassion. It is the place of prophecy. And prophecy at the city gate is not about predicting the future or turning back time. Instead, prophecy in some way makes the future present and redeems the past. Prophecy gives us a glimpse of what God sees and desires for us. It reveals the world through God's eyes and describes it 
with God's word. Sometimes prophecy criticizes and judges the world and relationships. That is not, however, the prophecy in today's stories. That is not what prophecy is like at the city gate. Prophecy at the city gate is energizing. It acknowledges the reality of our struggles and challenges and then points a way forward. Prophecy at the city gate offers life in the midst of death, hope in despair, joy in sorrow, presence in absence. Prophecy at the city gate is a light shining in the darkness. It says to us, friends, that God has looked favorably on God's people. That God has noticed us and has come to help. Prophecy at the city gate charts a direction and a way forward. Who then are our prophets? Certainly, Elijah and Jesus continue as God's prophets speaking words of life. In more modern times, I stand before the resilient, determined, and focused alumni who have spoken good words in bad times, revealing God's life in the midst of injustice, violence, and divisiveness, and calling us to a new level of consciousness. We remember the great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us in the church triumphant. We acknowledge other prophets that are more local, even anonymous, they are the volunteers who show up at the food pantries in our communities, proclaiming dignity in the midst of poverty, offering nourishment of body and soul in the midst of hunger. Local prophets are the ones who have sat with us as we wept. Their presence was not enough to give us the courage and hope to meet the days ahead. They are the ones who offer a word of encouragement and give us the confidence and the will to get up and live another day. These prophets have spoken God's presence by their lives and sometimes their words. They have experienced God and they offer us their experience as friends a way forward when we cannot find it for ourselves. Who are the prophets in today's stories? Obviously, Elijah and Jesus, less obviously, are the two widows. But these two anonymous women have stood at the gate. Of all the places God might be, God was there. They remind us we never stand there alone. Let the church say amen. These women and prophets proclaim the city gate to be the place of beginnings more than a place of endings. If they can stand at the city gate and live to tell about it, so can we. So should we. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen.
Friends, uh, at this moment, you have some free time. And at 5.30, you're welcome to come back where there we will have the Engel Organ Concert. Uh, and all are invited to continue with this moment of rejoicing and of gathering and of praising God together. Then after that, uh, I, it is my understanding that dinner is then on your own. Uh, so please feel free to enjoy many of the wonderful eateries in this area. Friends, let us receive the benediction. Y ahora que la gracia de nuestro Señor y Salvador Jesucristo, el amor de nuestro Dios Padre y Todopoderoso, y la comunión del Espíritu Santo sea con nosotros hoy y para siempre. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, the love of the living and awesome God, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. And all of God's people say, Amen. 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 May the peace of the Lord be with you.